lecture number six for Western Civ 1, the Hellenistic roots of Western civilization. As we begin today, I direct your attention back towards the scriptures again, uh, to the writings of the prophet Daniel. In Daniel chapter 8, uh, verses 5 and following, what we find is that he has a vision of coming kingdoms. This is similar to what he's had before. In this particular vision, what we find is he has a vision of a ram that represents the Medo-Persian Empire. And uh, this ram was powerful and charged towards the west and the north and the south, and no animal could stand against it and rescue them. He did as he pleased and became great. But in verse 5 we find that uh, Daniel writes, As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came towards the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged him at great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him, and the goat knocked him to the ground and trampled him and none could rescue the ram from his power. And the goat became very great. But at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. This prophecy goes on to predict the coming of various kingdoms, like the other visions that Daniel had had. But uh, Daniel is given an interpretation of this dream as we move on in Daniel chapter 8, uh, verse 18. And we find that uh, what he's informed in verse 19 is, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia, and the shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent the four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. So what we find here in this vision is a vision of the coming of the Greeks towards the east, led by Alexander the Great. The subsequent prophecies are so specific that uh, many people have long thought that Daniel must have been written after these events because they don't believe in predictive prophecy. But God, who knows about the future, could foretell these things to Daniel as he's working out his purposes in time and space within human decisions. Uh, he's able to tell Daniel about what would come to pass and uh, eventually the establishment of the kingdom of God. And the Greeks are one of the people groups that God uses in this development in time. Hellenistic political power and cultural dominance are going to be projected to the east by Alexander the Great, and they'll be carried on by his successors. And what we're going to find is that these successors would be a particular threat to the uh, continued existence of the Jews and threaten God's plan, but that that force, uh, which has such an important influence in shaping Western civilization, would be one that God would use in establishing a context in which Christianity would come. So as we begin today, we want to think about these Hellenistic roots of Western civilization. We need to begin by defining uh, what is Hellenistic. The ancient Greeks knew themselves as Hellenes. They lived in the land of Hellas. To be Hellenistic is to be Greek-like. So we've talked about classical Greece, and we've seen that they've made a number of cultural contributions towards Western civilization, but that those divided city-states, fragmented as they were, were vulnerable to invasion. Surprisingly, those Greeks were able to withstand the onslaught of the great Persian Empire, but they weren't able to survive against the challenge of a bunch of hillbillies up in northern part of the Balkan Peninsula from Macedonia. The Macedonians were something of an unlikely people to become dominant. They had rough terrain in which they lived, and it had only a small population. And uh, so this would be an obstacle to them. They don't have much in the way of population, and they don't have great resources. But they would come to find some new resources in those rugged hills, namely gold, which would help them, help them to finance their armies and to arm uh, their soldiers. Coming out of Macedonia, we have a leader by the name of Philip. He's actually the second Philip, so he's Philip II. 
and he began his reign in the year 359 BC, and he doesn't last for too terribly long. But Philip of Macedon uh, had grown up as a hostage. Uh, he had been taken as a hostage, as a young princeling, and had been raised in the Theban court, where he had been able to absorb something of their warrior ethos, and also to observe uh, their military strategies. And as this young man growing up at the court of the Thebans, uh, certainly he was aware of the politics of the day and the old threat of the Persians, and yet had been able to observe the Persians' vulnerability. The Persians were vulnerable because of dynastic squabbles amongst themselves, and the fact that they were dependent upon trying to maintain a multi-ethnic empire that had different languages and different uh, traditions, uh, all under one rule. And this vulnerability had particularly been exposed when uh, Greek mercenaries had fought on the side of one pretender to the throne. And uh, this account is preserved by a, a student of Plato by the name of Xenophon, who went together with 10,000 Greek mercenaries and was successful in battle, but unfortunately the champion for whom they fought had been killed, and the result was that they had to fight their way home. But what this showed uh, Philip was that the Persians were vulnerable. If a group of 10,000 soldiers could fight their way through the Persian Empire all the way from uh, the area of Mesopotamia back home to Greece, this was a vulnerable empire. So in order to pursue his dream, uh, he developed a number of strategies. His first is to unify Macedonia, and secondly, to build its military prowess. This would take some time and would be dependent upon the fact that wealth came to Macedonia in the discovery of gold in the hills. He was able to purchase military hardware for soldiers who couldn't otherwise afford it and build a standing military, people who this was their job. His second strategy after building up Macedonia was to divide and conquer the Greeks. He'd observed that they were vulnerable as they continued to squabble against each other. And so this is going to be the strategy that he takes. He's going to conquer them, but yet at the same time maintain the impression that much of everyday life continued on. So a lot of the activities for the local poles, the local cities, would be maintained. But he would be the power behind things. The Macedonian gold mines enabled them to have a state-equipped army and salaried soldiers who could fight uh, every day of the week. And they confronted Greek city-states which had long been uh, competing with each other for hegemony. The Athenians had been supplanted by the Spartans. The Spartans in turn had caused local rivalries and been supplanted by the Thebans. Now this is not Thebes in Egypt, this is Thebes in Greece to the north of Athens. And there had been ongoing conflicts uh, something of a sacred war had gone on. Uh, and so the Greek city-states were at odds with each other, even though there had been attempts to promote a common peace amongst the Greeks. Philip wisely played one city-state off against another. And as he rose in power, a famous orator in Athens by the name of Demosthenes warned against these Macedonians in his uh, orations known as the Philippics. In them, this uh, orator warned against the coming of Philip II. But the perception was that they're just a bunch of hillbillies who are no great population. They're no great th threat to anybody. And so as a result, in Athens, as in other Greek city-states, the Macedonians weren't perceived as a great threat until they were on the brink of victory. The pivotal battle in bringing about the Macedonian conquest of Greece was the Battle of Chaeronea in the year 338 BC. In this battle, uh, the Macedonians used longer spears than had typically been the case. This is something that Philip had learned from the Thebans. He also incorporated the use of cavalry. Leading some of his cavalry was his 18-year-old son, Alexander. Alexander uh, grew up in something of a dysfunctional family, but he had had the benefits of the best education that a princeling could have. 
And as a result of the Battle of Chaeronea, the Greeks were defeated. And Philip subsequently consolidated his gains by creating a league, a Hellenic league, and by uh, maintaining the facade of the polis, maintaining the facade of independence, that things continued on as they had before, except now there wasn't the fighting. And as a result, there was greater prosperity, and there's greater loyalty then to Macedonia. While the Greek city-states developed their loyalty towards Philip, within his own household there were problems, and as a result he was assassinated in the year 336 BC. This left his son in the position of inheriting the power. Some people thought this young 20-year-old son uh, wasn't a chip off the old block, wasn't somebody who was particularly dangerous, and so there would be some attempts to rise up against him. But Alexander had been trained for leadership. As we think about his personality, we find some stories that um, tell about his childhood and uh, various things that seem to uh, suggest that great things were to come. Uh, in his education and training, uh, we find that he was somebody who received military training from his father. Uh, he had uh, a tutor in the person of Aristotle, the famous Greek uh, philosopher. And uh, while he was a student of Aristotle, uh, this doesn't mean that he was a disciple of Aristotle. There are some things in Aristotle's teaching that we might see reflected in the subsequent activities of Alexander the Great. But back to thinking about his personality, uh, there's an interesting story told about Alexander as a young man, which shows him to be a perceptive individual, uh, and a person who is rather brash at the same time. As a young princeling, uh, he apparently was watching uh, horse trainers try to break a horse. Uh, the horse was a dangerous beast and had thrown off many of its uh, wannabe riders, and uh, this horse was a magnificent specimen, but it was uh, unrideable. It had the name Bucephalus, which basically means cowhead. Uh, so it wasn't seen to be terribly smart, but it was a bit of a dangerous horse. But as Alexander watched people try to ride this horse, what he came to perceive was that the horse was afraid of its own shadow. And so as he jumped down into the uh, ring and climbed aboard this horse, certainly the uh, People mining things were quite concerned suddenly, uh, anxious that a princeling might be hurt by being thrown from the horse. But he caused the horse to move into the sun, and as a result, uh, was able to tame it. This horse supposedly became his mount for years to come. Now, whether that story is all completely true or not, we don't know. Uh, but uh, there were lots of things that seemed to portend great things to come. The Theban city in the southern part of Greece revolted uh, as, they, as Alexander came to power, and as a result, uh, he'd respond to that threat by crushing it, uh, destroying everything in Thebes except the house of a philosopher that he admired. This helped crush subsequent uh, Greek revolts against him. Uh, he responded with great violence. Bad things happen if you rebel against Alexander. Subsequently there are also invasions by non-Greek speaking peoples and he dealt with those situations, again building loyalty and the conviction that he was a great military leader. Once he consolidated his control of Greece, he picked up on a dream that he had inherited from his father, namely the invasion and defeat of the Persians. He was able to raise an army of about 35,000 men to embark on this campaign into what we know today as Turkey. In this Anatolian campaign, his first great battle was the Battle of Granicus River in the year 334. He's able to move within a year here from the westernmost parts of the Persian Empire all the way to the heart of Persia. As he comes to Turkey, he is able to gain support from some Greek-speaking peoples there along the Ionian coast, and he's able to take advantage of his uh, victory as a cavalry leader at Granicus River to press on across uh, what we know today as Turkey, 
uh, towards the uh, Cilician Gates near Tarsus um, in the southeastern part of Turkey, where he wins the Battle of Issus. At the Battle of Issus, he's able to capture the family of Darius III. And Darius III, having a great large empire, sues for peace. He's willing to give up half of his empire in order to retrieve his family. But Alexander doesn't want that. There's an interesting mosaic depiction of Alexander and Darius III found in a mosaic floor at Pompeii, just at the moment when the battle turned uh, that captures something of the uh, personalities and the pivotal time period that happened right there in the midst of that battle. Alexander was a fellow who led from the front. He was engaged and his soldiers believed in him because he took the same risks that they did. He wasn't a general who commanded from behind. As he moves on pursuing the Persians, uh, he makes a point of capturing Mediterranean ports first. Now, there's a number of good reasons to have done this. Uh, first of all, he's able to consolidate his communication lines and to make sure that he's not cut off uh, from uh, connections back in Greece uh, by the Persian navy that was run by the Phoenicians. This also would guarantee that he could maintain his supply lines. In order to do this, he moved down the coast of Syria and uh, came up against the, per the Phoenicians at the city of Tyre. In the fulfillment of prophecies that we find back in the book of Ezekiel, we find that Tyre is destroyed by Alexander the Great. He didn't have a navy of any great magnitude, and the Phoenician navy was renowned. The way that he was able to conquer it was by tearing down the city of Tyre and dumping all the debris into the sea until he's able to build a causeway out to the island uh, where they had their port and is able to capture the city in 332 BC. The result was that he had now consolidated his lines of support, but he went on down the coast of the Mediterranean, past Judea, to Egypt. Now, if we read in Josephus, the Jewish historian, what we find is that he was received positively by the Jews, who reported to him that their prophets had told them that he was coming, and they welcomed his coming, and so they were no uh, obstacle to him, and he... Uh, left them alone to practice their religion and went on down to Egypt, which was a much larger economic prize. In Egypt, he didn't have to fight great battles. Uh, there he was fairly well received by the Egyptians and consolidated his hold. But as Alexander moves along, sometimes he adopts things along the way, and there were some troubles amongst his men as he took on the trappings of pharaohs. Back in Greece, he had been another man. But now he seems to accept the uh, praises of the Egyptians who worship their leaders as gods. And this troubled some of his followers. But he was still magnificently successful. He went on to pursue his uh, Mesopotamian campaign, refusing to make peace as uh, peace treaties were offered by the Persians. And eventually at the Battle of Galgamela, also known as the Battle of Arabella, in the year 30, 331, he defeated the forces of Darius III, and Darius III fled. Subsequently, Darius III would be assassinated by somebody who thought that he might win favor of Alexander the Great. And the result was that the Persian capital cities of Persepolis, and Pasargadae, Nekbatana, and Babylon came within the control of the Macedonians. These were great capital cities, very rich cities. Of these rich cities, what we find is Alexander burned buildings built by King Xerxes, something of revenge for the Greeks who had seen the city of Athens burned about 150 years earlier uh, in the year uh, 480. The uh, Sorry, that was 50 years earlier. Um, his campaign of military expansion was not yet over. Um, he embarked going further eastward into what we know today as um, eastern Iran and Afghanistan into what was then known as Bactria. As a result, he's able to consolidate territories that the Persians had dominated, 
and defeat other enemies as well. And so the Persians and the Scythians and other people groups in Bactria come under his control. While in Bactria, uh, he catches an eye of Roxanne, a Bactrian princess, uh, who he marries. But he persists in his war efforts going on uh, through Pakistan today and into India, where he fights in the Indus River Valley. There he battles with Haida Spes, and uh, sorry, <laughs> there he battles with Porus on the uh, Haida Spes, a tributary of the Indus River, and uh, keeps driving eastward until his soldiers eventually mutiny. They're a long, long way from home, wondering if they'll ever, ever get back. And so as a result, disappointed with his men, uh, they make their way back along the coast of the Arabian Sea, where they have to fight their way through the salt deserts, and a large number of the men die along the way. But eventually he makes his way back up into Mesopotamia and uh, has to deal with this ongoing challenge uh, to his authority. Uh, this would be a serious problem for him, but he doesn't last too terribly much longer because as he comes to Babylon, we're going to find that he's going to fall sick. Now, in his speeches, what we find is that Alexander had worked to consolidate his empire, that he had uh, incorporated mercenaries from other people groups within his war group, uh, and there were some Greeks who felt that this compromised their relationship with him. But an idea that seems to appear in some of his speeches and his actions is that he seems to have believed in the brotherhood of mankind. Uh, he's not looking to give particular great privileges to the Greeks over other people that he ruled. But Alexander the Great uh, does succeed in many ways in consolidating his empire. Part of this is he promotes the economic situation. Uh, some of that is promoted by his use of coinage. And so we find his face adorns a lot of coins, uh, particularly as he's depicted as uh, Hercules sometimes on those coins. And he established particularly cities through which he would promote his uh, empire, uh, these poles, which were under his authority. Uh, there's about 70 different cities, many of them named Alexandria. The most famous of those, of course, is going to be the one that's in Egypt. But Alexander the Great died in 323. Uh, he was great in that he had established the largest empire that the world had yet known. It stretched from Macedonia in the northwest, south to Egypt, and all the way across uh, to India. While Alexander had been a great general and had uh, been a great conqueror, uh, he hadn't established a system of succession. His wife Roxanne had given birth to a young child, uh, but Alexander III is not going to live long enough to inherit his father's throne. This empire that Alexander had created had a number of challenges. Uh, the first challenge was that it was certainly made up of lots of different people groups with different languages and cultures. But the most difficult challenge was the fact that he had no strong successor. Again, his wife Roxanne had a child, and he had a brother named Philip. But his brother was weak, and his brother was soon assassinated, along with Roxanne and the baby. At Alexander's deathbed, a number of his generals were brought together. These generals are sometimes known as the Diadochi. That basically just translates as successors. And the Diadochi allegedly asked Alexander on his deathbed, who should rule? And his response supposedly was the enigmatic response to the strongest. This response set up 40 years of conflict as four different generals would vie for control of Alexander's great empire and split it up. This fulfills the prophecy that we found back in Daniel, that the one great horn would be supplanted by four smaller horns. The most prominent of his successors would probably be that of Ptolemy, a general who ruled in Egypt and would establish his capital in Alexandria in Egypt and establish a dynasty, a family that would rule over Egypt all the way up until the generation before the coming of Christ. 
they're going to rule over Egypt as a dynastic family that brings Greek culture to Egypt. Other great generals included Seleucus. Uh, Seleucus establishes the Seleucid Empire, and they're going to control the eastern part of this empire uh, that's going to go all the way across from Syria, across uh, the area of Iraq and uh, Iran today. And uh, their capital city is going to be Antioch. Uh, this will be the same Antioch that you find in the New Testament in the book of Acts, uh, from which the Apostle Paul and Barnabas are going to be sent out as missionaries. It will be a major city in the Roman Empire at a later time period. The Seleucids have as a serious challenge in the area of Iran the Parthian people, and they're going to lose much of their eastern empire in short order. But they're going to expand their empire westward into Turkey, and they're going to have aspirations for controlling the Levant, the area where Israel is located, and they're going to come into competition with the Ptolemies for that territory. And so the Middle East is going to be a land of conflict again, particularly around the year 199 BC. The third uh, general that takes over is Antigonus Gonates. Uh, he establishes the dynasty of the Antigonids. Uh, they would rule in the area of the Balkan Peninsula with their capital city is Pella, the old Macedonian capital city. There, uh, they're going to have a lot of challenges keeping all these uh, the Balkan Peninsula held together, uh, and uh, this is going to divide them. And they're also going to face the challenge of the Celtic migra migration as the Celts move uh, down into the area from the north and disrupt uh, society in that area. This will weaken them. The fourth and final of these generals would be Lysimachus, who establishes the Adelid dynasty in what we know today as Western Turkey. His capital city would be Pergamum. Uh, like the Antigonids, he would face the challenge of the Celtic migrations, which would greatly weaken him and his successors. Eventually, uh, the Antigonids and the Attalids would fall to the Romans, as would the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. But that's a story we'll talk about in subsequent lectures. These Hellenistic successor states were in competition with each other and at times would fight uh, for control of boundaries and uh, would fight against the incursions of uh, waves of immigrants like those uh, Celts. But all of them are going to eventually uh, be taken over by the Romans, and this is something we'd anticipate by the prophecies of Daniel uh, years and years earlier. But we want to think here a little bit about the cultural significance of the Hellenistic successor states and uh, their cultural influence as they pass on Greek culture uh, to subsequent generations, and particularly to the Romans and to us in Europe. The Greek and Oriental traditions were amalgamated in the Hellenistic empires. This was done in part because they allowed intermarriage between the Greeks and non-Greeks. And when there's prosperity and peaceful coexistence, there's exchange of ideas. This is particularly promoted through the expansion of trade. When Alexander the Great uh, invaded the Persian empires, uh, he set loose a great deal of expenditures. There's a lot of gold and silver bullion, which had been held in the Persian capitals, is released. If you read in the writings of the later prophets, what you find amongst the uh, Israelites, uh, not the Israelites, the people of Judea, uh, was that there had been a lot of economic problems where Jews had been selling each other into slavery within the Persian Empire. But uh, when all that Persian bullion is uh, set free in the economy, it stimulates the economy in significant ways. And these city-states that, uh, the, these not city-states, these cities that Alexander had developed are going to uh, prosper and promote long-distance trade. And with coins and standardized currencies and weights and measures, what we're going to find is that long-distance trade is going to pick up. And this is going to promote prosperity. And with prosperity, there'll become uh, money to be expended on uh, various uh, cultural uh, items that uh, otherwise uh, get kicked to the curb when economic things are tight. Uh, cultural things like drama and uh, sculpture and 
other art, artistic types of things. Uh, these uh, activities of long distance trade are particularly promoted by uh, peace in these large kingdoms and uh, by control of the seas. Now we've talked about these cities that are developed. Uh, these cities, many of them are natural cities located where they're uh, at the at strategic locations where they might establish ports along the coast or in passes or uh, various locations where movement of people is naturally channeled. And so at these locations, they served as important trade centers. As these cities are developed, some of them were older cities that are just refurbished, but as new cities were developed, they embraced certain ideas from the Greeks. And one of the Greeks architectural ideas that they had was that of the Hippodamian city plan. In the Hippodamian plan, uh, you have a cardo, a heart street. Uh, in the word cardo, you'd recognize the word cardiac, perhaps. So this is the heart street. It's the main street that travels through town. And cutting across that at right angles would be decumani. A decumanus is a street that cuts the cardo uh, at a right angle. And at intersections, sometimes you might have tetrapylons, these intersections where a lot of trade and business might take place. And so they're planned cities. These Greek cities also develop defensive fortifications and walls. And uh, so these cities are going to feel safe and secure, places from which people can do business. In these cities, what we find is that there's a growing middle class as uh, craft specialists are able to prosper and to accumulate wealth. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, the Macedonian Empire had enslaved a number of people along the way, and so they'll continue to be uh, large slave populations within this empire. As we think about the politics of this area, the polis is very important, and the polis had participatory government uh, where you had some limited local autonomy. Uh, but yet they would be subject to provincial rulers, and oftentimes these cities would be bound together in confederations. But all cities were under the Hellenistic monarchs. These monarchs, taking ideas from the Egyptians, ruled as quasi-divine kings, kind of like pharaohs. They were seen to be uh, gods in the flesh. And all of them were subject to some degree of ruler worship. Uh, this will be a characteristic, and they'll build great palaces known as basilica, and um, this will be a form that will be adopted later on in the construction of churches. Greek society was recognized as something of a superior culture by many people. Uh, they were the conquerors, and so many people would tend towards adopting a Hellenistic culture. Uh, many times they would syncretize, that is, they would blend their culture with Greek culture. And so, as a result, what we find is that in Egypt, for example, amongst the Ptolemies, uh, the Ptolemaic monarchs were oftentimes depicted in artwork as pharaohs of old. Uh, the gods of Egypt continued to be worshipped. Uh, but what we find is the embrace of uh, Greek culture increasingly uh, amongst them. And this would be true uh, in the area of the uh, Seleucids and the Antigonids and the Attalids. Uh, Greek culture is something that's respected. Now in Greek culture, one of the aspects of Greek culture was its religion. Uh, the Greeks were traditionally polytheistic and uh, Yet amongst the Greeks, they were rather syncretistic. They never engaged in systematic theology. Uh, lots of times there's rival theologies from different cities that would claim uh, certain stories. Uh, and so this is not an area that they had particularly uh, been renowned for, but the Greeks were somewhat tolerant religiously. And this is gonna be a characteristic of the syncretism that takes place in Hellenistic culture, uh, where they mix and match religions. Now, during the Hellenistic period here, what we find is that the gods of the ancient Greeks and their stories had fallen on hard times. Um, they weren't seen to be particularly responsive to the supplications and sacrifices that were made at their temples. And increasingly amongst the Greeks, there was a focus upon 
the goddess of luck. She was known as Tyche. While some people were looking towards satisfying this goddess of fortune, trying to bring about better luck, other people abandoned their religions and became atheists. Uh, they didn't believe that the gods, if they did exist, had anything to do with people. They were rather disinterested. But many people still longed to answer eternal questions. And in doing so, they, they looked back towards the gods and saw the gods as being the source of their existence. But amongst Greek philosophers, we'll find that there was a local challenge uh, to some of this. But coming out of the East, there were also a new religious theme that came to be embraced in Hellenistic culture, uh, not just in Greece, but in other parts where there were Hellenistic monarchs. This oftentimes involved uh, amalgamating uh, Oriental ideas with Greek ideas, and uh, the people wanted to particularly to have some answer about what happened when they died, to answer the eternal question of what happens to me die and when I die. And in this quest, many of them embrace gods who, according to new stories that arose, had died and been resurrected. And through them, particularly as these gods died on their behalf, then they could have life hereafter. These religions come to be known as the mystery religions. They're mysterious to us because we don't know that much about them because you had to go through orientation rites and uh, uh, conversion rites along the way. And so there's a number of mystery religions. These are going to hang around for a long time. And uh, some people see Christianity as picking up some of its ideas from a mystery religion as it has a God who dies for people for their salvation. One of the problems, however, is that a lot of the texts that get studied come from a post-Christian context. And so our textbook writer uh, gets off the rails here on this question. The mystery religions, in the mystery religions, you have religions like the Eleusinian mysteries. Eleusis is a location near to Athens where people went back to the old story of Persephone and Demeter. And through going through these rites, they had something of a religious experience where they came to think that they understood the world better and that they would have some continued existence. Another very famous uh, mystery religion uh, would be that of Magna Mater, the great fertility goddess. And uh, in Egypt, the worship of Isis and Serapis. Or coming from over in the area of Persia, uh, from the worship of Ahura Mazda would come the worship of uh, uh, the mystery religion that was adopted by lots of Roman soldiers uh, as they would uh, look towards uh, this Persian religion, at least the rump of that, uh, in their beliefs. And we'll find that that's going to be something that's perpetuated as far west as Hadrian's Wall up in uh, the borders of Scotland in Roman times. As lots of Roman soldiers are going to embrace the religion of Mithras. Mithraism. Uh, in Mithraism, uh, people believe they're saved by Mithras, and in later times, uh, there's this, an inscription that talks about people being baptized and covered by the blood in a rite known as the Torobolium. Now, in Mithraism, uh, this was an expensive rite of passage, and one that we only know about from the fifth century, uh, where in an inscription it talks about being. Uh, baptized by the blood, and I think that this is much longer after Christianity, where perhaps uh, there, if there is any influence between the two, the influences come from Christianity to Mithraism at that point in time. The uh, baptism of the Mithraic cult was not one that uh, was for eternity, but for ten years. In this rite, basically, a person was placed beneath a animal, a bull that was slaughtered and the blood washed over the person. And uh, I think this is something of a Mithraic uh, adoption of Christian ideas uh, after the year 400. But this is an issue that some people see. They think that Christianity gets its ideas from the mystery religions, but there's very clearly connections between the mystery religions and earlier religions, and we're going to find that Christianity stands very, very different. But in the religious context, what I want you to see is that initially amongst the the Hellenists, they were rather tolerant religiously. And the result would be that uh, the Jews would spread as they conducted business around the uh, 
Hellenistic empires and would in places build synagogues in places like Egypt uh, where the Jews had fled at an earlier time uh, in the city of Alexandria and by the time we come to the birth of Jesus a quarter of the city is Jewish and there are synagogues that are there and there's a large Jewish population in Egypt uh, that is tolerated uh, by the Ptolemies. Now in response to the challenges of life in the fallen world uh, some people sought to uh, answer questions of life and two uh, significant philosophies emerged during this time period. There's a number of other philosophies that emerged but I want to um, uh, focus particularly upon Epicureanism and Stoicism as philosophical contributions to Western society. Epicureanism gets its name from Epicurus of Samos. Uh, he's a fellow who uh, is particularly active around the year 300 and this philosopher uh, said that the chief objective of life was to find pleasure. Now this isn't uh, the pleasure that leads to excess. This would be freedom from pain and fear and you know if one goes and gets drunk well then there's going to be hangovers and uh, uh, you know, that would be painful. So that wasn't the sort of thing that he looked towards but we'll find that some of his followers at later times will embrace so-called vulgar Epicureanism uh, where they seek pleasure immediately they eat, want to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow they die and they can't do much about it. But Epicurus was a fellow who was influenced by his view of the world that it was made up of atoms. And you know he didn't deny the existence of the gods, but he basically asserted that they didn't interfere with our lives, they didn't have anything to do with us, and basically ignored the world. And so uh, in this world, his idea was that you should pursue pleasure. And the epitome of pleasure, according to him, was to enjoy the company of friends while enjoying food and having a picnic. What he thinks is that what you ought to do is to ignore the world around you largely and focus on yourself. Uh, avoid extremes, avoid disturbances that would trouble you. There are many people today who would ascribe to this that uh, pleasure is their chief objective in life. Another philosophy that's going to be very influential for years to come would be that of Stoicism. A fellow by the name of Zeno, a philosopher who comes from Cyprus, and is particularly effective around year 314, um, asserted that the chief objective of life was to pursue virtue, uh, to endure the hardships that come with living in this world, but the way that you'd best do that was by living in harmony with the divine will. Now this is an impersonal divine will that's expressed in nature. In his philosophy, uh, which he particularly promoted on the Stoa Poikile, that's where he gets his name, he's basically on the painted porch in Athens. Um, he, he promoted his ideas there and he taught things like the unity of mankind and encouraged people to be engaged in society but to uh, get out of nature's way, like the Epicureans, to avoid uh, disturbance, uh, to be one with the mechanisms of the world. So as a result, if somebody dies, you shouldn't be so terribly upset. And this leads, leads rise to a, a common uh, epitaph that's found in ancient Roman tombs a later time period. In Greek they might write the word tharsi. Cheer up. Uh, you need to cheer up because no one's immortal. Everybody's going to die. That's the way things are. And so you need to get over it and move along. Rather than being distressed, that's the way things are. You accept it and move on. Stoicism is going to be an influential philosophy amongst the Romans for some time to come. And Epicureanism will be something that also is adopted by many people. And so people adopt these philosophies. Now there are a couple of other philosophies that uh, emerge in this time period. One of those would be the cynics. Uh, cynicism is gets its name from its enemies where it's basically saying that you're living like dogs. And the other would be skepticism. Uh, amongst the skeptics uh, they would believe that uh, you know, if there is truth that they're skeptical. They doubt whether or not people might be able to discern that truth. And uh, neither one of these philosophies is terribly influential. Although we see uh, uh, people today sometimes embracing aspects of this philosophy. So philosophy provided some people answers to the life uh, that they're living in a fallen world. Um, 
that their religion hadn't been providing for them. Based upon Greek philosophy and observance of the world, we find that science develops in the Hellenistic period. Uh, amongst philosophers, some of them who travel around as peripatetics, uh, we're going to find that there's a number of important developments that come, although they're not always recognized immediately. And so Aristarchus of Samos uh, would challenge Aristotle's understanding of the world. And he would advocate a heliocentric universe. That would be that the sun is the center of the system in which we live, rather than the earth being the center of all of that. Uh, his challenge isn't going to be recognized until we get into the 15th century uh, with uh, the uh, early modern observations of Copernicus. Uh, down in Egypt, another observer of the world was Aristophanes. Aristophanes was observing things that he observed around him, and uh, what he observed was that uh, on this particular day of the year, when you have uh, an equinox, that the sun shone directly over uh, a particular location in Egypt, down the south part of Egypt, and on that day, a very, very deep well at noon, the sun shone on the bottom. But at the same time, in Alexandria, 400 miles to the north, uh, there were shadows that were cast. Based upon his observations, uh, he came to calculate that the world was a sphere. It wasn't flat. It was a spherical Earth. And in fact, by his calculations, he calculated that the world was 24,675 miles around. He only missed it by about 200 miles. But again, his ideas were not embraced by everybody. down in Egypt, uh, in Alexandria, a very famous mathematician around the year 300 was Euclid. Uh, in his elements, he provides the basis for geometry, uh, something that some of you might have studied along the way is uh, the geometry that comes out of Euclid. These are people who are observing the world around them, and uh, sometimes they find specific applications for that. Uh, perhaps the most famous of the uh, Hellenistic uh, scientists, if you will, natural philosophers, would be Archimedes. He's particularly famous for Syracuse, for physics. Uh, he came from the town of Syracuse, and uh, he's a little bit later, as he's going to die eventually in the year 212 in the context of the Second Punic War. Syracuse is a city uh, that's built on the island of Sicily. That's the island being kicked by the boot of Italy. But there he served the king of Syracuse, and uh, as the uh, war with Rome emerged, he would develop a number of uh, mechanisms which would impede the Roman conquest. Now, he's a fellow who had studied a number of things, but he's very famous for his uh, studies of levers and pulleys, uh, using mechanical means to gain advantages. and. Uh, it's just very interesting uh, to look at some of the applications which are going to allow the uh, Romans to move great stones in some of their architectural constructions at later times. Uh, Archimedes is perhaps most famous uh, for his discoverment, uh, discovering of uh, displacement of water and its significance. Uh, he had been given an assignment by the king of Syracuse to discern if a gold crown which had been fabricated for the king was indeed made completely of gold. So how do you do that without tearing it apart, without cutting into it? Could it be made of lead just coated with gold? Had all the gold that had been given to the uh, uh, manufacturer been used? Or was it uh, spirited away and some other material substituted? So how in the world do you find out what's in something uh, without cutting it apart or melting it down to see if it was indeed truly purely gold? Faced with this, uh, this physicist, Archimedes, uh, went to the local baths. And as he got in his bath, uh, he displaced water and it poured up over the top. And uh, he came to understanding. Uh, and he came to understand displacement and how it is that ships float. That the amount of water that they displace is uh, equal to how high they uh, it has to do with the weight of the ship and how much water is being displaced. And so 
using this discernment, he came up with the understanding of specific gravity. And so he could take an irregular shape like his own body and realize it displaced water. And he could catch that amount of water and find the volume of that irregularly shaped object. And then he could weigh that uh, volume of gold out and he could compare it to that crown. Anyway, he was all excited with this discovery, and allegedly he jumped out of his bathtub, sh shrieking the word Eureka, running down the street naked. Uh, Eureka means, I found it. Now, while he made a number of discoveries and certainly had lots of applications in the area of optics and physics and military applications, there's a couple things that are particularly uh, interesting. Uh, it, one of his most famous developments is something known as the Archimedes Screw, uh, which is basically an auger. If you've been on a farm, perhaps you've seen grain move from one place to another, but the Archimedes screw was used to pump water in various places, like down in Egypt, and this will be an important uh, technological development. Uh, the other would be uh, what he had placed on his tombstone. Uh, what he knew uh, his most famous discernment, according to him, was that he knew the ratio between a sphere and an inscribed cylinder. It's basically two to three. Uh, he knew about pi and uh, working out volumes. Pi r cubed will give you the volume of a sphere. And so if you have a, uh, a cylinder in which a sphere is inscribed where that sphere touches the sides, and the top and the bottom um, to work out the uh, volume of a cylinder it's pi r squared multiplied by the height and uh, so as a result he knew what the ratio would be between a sphere and an inscribed cylinder this was the thing that charmed him most and that he allegedly had put on his tombstone uh, he was unfortunately killed uh, by a roman soldier who resented the fact that his machines had been launching uh, huge stones which had been sinking the invading Roman ships and uh, causing death amongst the Roman soldiers. Amongst Hellenistic cultural contributions outside the area of science, um, still in, sorry, in the area of science, would be in the area of um, medicine. Um, what we'd seen before amongst the Greeks is you had the Hippocratic Oath where doctors basically take the oath to do no harm. Uh, during the Hellenistic time period, what we find down in Egypt is that uh, Hierophilus uh, down in Egypt had uh, begun to engage in uh, doing dissections and studying of human bodies, and uh, yet uh, some of these ideas are going to be something that are going to be uh, supplanted by all kinds of quacks along the way. But there is some move towards some new surgical techniques that come out during this time period. Moving from the area of uh, science uh, to the area of literature, what we find is that uh, during the Hellenistic time period, that coming out of Egypt, the papyrus material that the Egyptians had written on would be something that would popularize and would be spread up the coast uh, to the old Phoenician city of Byblos. And it's in Byblos that we find the beginning of the production of books. This is going to be very important later on as they're going to eventually make uh, choirs that come together to make books uh, rather than having scrolls. Another t writing material that's perhaps in some ways more uh, durable would be parchment. These are animal skins that are specially treated and uh, stretched and able to last a long time. And in the city of Pergamum, we'll find that parchment will develop. Uh, these writing materials are going to be important for the promotion of ideas uh, and preservation of ideas for years to come. Amongst Hellenistic authors, what we find is that they have uh, the motive of pride uh, to put their name on something, to discover something new, is something that's embraced in this culture. And at times they have also the additional benefit of patronage, that people would pay them to write things that they might be patrons for, and thereby they gain notoriety. In the Hellenistic world, what we find is an increased literacy rate and larger audiences for books. And so there's going to be some uh, benefit in writing amongst people. As we look at the literature produced by 
uh, authors of this time period, we find is that uh, in the area of popular writing, that uh, there would be new dramas that were written. And in the Greek theater uh, at this time period, the Hellenistic time period, what we find is the embrace of new comedy. Uh, this is much more in tune with we, what we might recognize as being comedy, uh, famous uh, dramas written by people like Menander. Some of this could get rather violent and rather realistic at times. Uh, there were also new epics which were produced, uh, like that of Apollonius in his Argonauta, uh, talking about Jason and the Argonauts, for example, so they could create fictive stories. Uh, but also in their drama, what we see is an increased focus on everyday life types of things. Other texts which were written in this time period would be things like history. Uh, Polybius, a Hellenistic author here, begins a history of the world. Uh, we don't have all of his works preserved for us, but they provide an important uh, resource for us in understanding uh, this time period and what they remembered of times that went before. Amongst texts that are produced, some of them would be religious, and there's a very important text that is produced this time period at Alexandria in Egypt for a great library that the Ptolemies uh, founded there in Alexandria, and that would be uh, the Septuagint. Now, this is interesting. It's abbreviated as LXX if you look at uh, English letters, but this would be Latin numbers, Roman numbers, for 70. According to the tradition, 70 scholars produced this translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in a period of 70 days. And they all came up with the same essential translation. This is going to be the Bible that's used at times by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Uh, we're going to have a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And so there's a number of texts that are preserved uh, from earlier times in Greek translations. And... Uh, these Greek translations uh, reflect the Greek of this Hellenistic period. In other areas of cultural achievement, we find that the Greeks uh, also patronized the production of art, uh, painting various things, not just porches, but uh, also domestic interiors where they portray people in a realistic fashion, uh, producing portraits. We'll find this is exemplified in uh, personal portraits that are painted of deceased persons uh, that are placed on mummies in Egypt. And uh, we see uh, portraiture at Marissa in uh, Israel. Uh, so individual portraits are painted, which give us some idea of what people look like. Uh, they worked at being realistic in their artwork here. Uh, as far as other subjects of, of uh, visual arts, uh, we find that the in the Hellenistic period there continued to be sculpture as they had uh, wealth to expend, particularly amongst uh, kings. Sometimes they would have uh, depictions of rulers, but that there were also pieces which were made that depicted everyday life, as well as uh, traditional mythological subjects. Some of these could be built at very very large scale. And so, amongst the wonders of the ancient world, coming from this time period, what we'll find is that uh, you had the great metal statue built of the Colossus at the island of Rhodes, a very wealthy trading center in the Aegean, and also the statue of Zeus. Uh, these would be two of the seven wonders of the ancient world that Antipater of uh, Sidon would identify. There are other architectural achievements amongst those uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. Some of them had come from earlier, like the Great Pyramid or the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. But amongst the structures that are built in the Hellenistic period uh, would be the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, uh, with all of its sculptural decorations, or the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Uh, these would be great architectural uh, items which were built. Um, so architecturally they built monumental public architecture uh, which would include temples but they also built uh, civic installations like theaters. Uh, they also would build lighthouses to direct ships, the Pharos, this uh, lighthouse in Alexandria using optics supposedly could 
cast lights with its uh, uh, reflective mirrors, which would uh, direct ships out at sea. And they're able to build that tall tower uh, because their architectural achievements, they're learning how to lift things using pulleys uh, to build these great structures. Uh, something else that will be promoted across the Hellenistic world would be uh, the creation of gymnasia, where people would practice uh, their athletic prowess to become good citizens. Uh, another type of civic structure would be defensive structures. Uh, the Greeks would build very, very uh, imposing city walls, and once again, the use of pulleys and levers uh, and wheels would be important in the movement of large pieces of stone uh, and that technology would be something that the Romans would later on embrace. So what we've seen is that the uh, Greeks have made many cultural achievements which are carried on by the um, Hellenists. Perhaps the most important of these is language. It has a continuing influence on English with a large portion of the English language borrowing Greek words, but most importantly would be the Koine dialect of Greek uh, the Bible is written in. Now, Greek cultural spread is something that is a challenge to the Jews, and the Jews would resist Hellenization. Now, along the way, there was widespread acquiescence to Greek culture. Lots of things were adopted along the way. Many Jews would adopt Greek names. In the New Testament, what we find is that Jesus has a disciple named Philip, for example. Um, so lots of Greek names would be adopted by Jews, but um, the problem really emerged when the uh, Seleucids defeated the Ptolemies and took control of the Levant, the area of Palestine. And then they tried to impose a Hellenizing cultural policy, tried to force the Jews to become Greeks. They forbade them to circumcise their boys. Uh, they insisted they sacrifice uh, to the gods to recognize the king as a god, and all these things were an affront to Jewish uh, cultural sensitivities as uh, some Jews held on to their traditions revealed by Moses. Um, and as a result, Antiochus Epiphanes, that's his nickname, he's basically saying, when you see me, you've seen an epiphany, you've seen a god. And um, when he tried to push his Judea, his uh, Hellenizing program on the Jews, they revolted as an old priest by the name of Mattathias, uh, led by his sons, would promote a revolt. Particularly famous would be his son Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, who uh, would rebel against the, uh, the Greek cultural program and eventually succeed in allying uh, with the Romans and creating the Hasmonean dynasty, where the Jews for about a hundred years would maintain their own, own rule. Um, what we're going to find is that Hellenistic cultural power is going to last for a long time. Their political power rose and fell, uh, but the cultural influence again was pervasive and contributed greatly to the formation of Western civilization as succeeding political powers in Rome and succeeding generations built on Hellenistic ideas and accomplishments. <laughs>